Something that's all the go these days, something that's uh, kind of on everyone's lips, or uh, at least in the media, is the rise of China. China rising, the dragon is awakening. Uh, Napoleon has famously uh, said, uh, let China sleep, for when she awakens, the world will be sorry. Um, I've visited China, and, and any, to, to anyone who's ever been to, say, Shanghai, or uh, any number of places in China, you are kind of... <gasps> you know, uh, taken aback by what you see when you go there. Everywhere you go, you see evidence of prodigious energy and construction, and everyone seems to be heading, you know, in towards some large goal. Um, uh, the country seems to be, does indeed seem to be rising fast. And uh, where it's going is, uh, well, we all... We all know where we think it's going. The, the prediction is that by 2050, it will have supplanted the United States as the uh, world's largest economy. Uh, it's already, just in the last uh, little while, uh, overtaken Japan, which Japan was, was yesterday's Leviathan. Japan was, in the 1980s, supposedly uh, going to put uh, the West, the United States, uh, in the shade, more or less permanently. Um, now, that kind of makes people uneasy, I find. Uh, there, there's a lot of, well, where is this going to end? Uh, where, is, where is this going to lead? And, and it's always left as sort of a question mark as to where all this is going to go. Uh, but kind of a uneasy, uh, slightly negative, fear-laden uh, question mark. What are the Chinese going to do? Well, first of all, I don't think that we can actually say in 50 years or in 40 years, I suppose, where the entire world is going to be. We don't know. 20 years ago, um, no one would have believed that the uh, or that the Soviet Union, or I would say 30 years ago, that the Soviet Union was going to collapse. It just that that was beyond the scope of our imaginations. Uh, Richard Nixon believed that the Soviet Union was going to be eventually win the Cold War, and Richard Nixon, for all his faults, was not a stupid man. Um, so I wonder what it is about about the uh, about the Chinese that actually makes us uneasy. Their history actually is nowhere near as bloody as uh, Western history. Um, they've generally been uh, the victim of uh, uh, other people, um, but they're so large that uh, they generally are resilient enough to, uh, to uh, over the long haul, withstand uh, the incursions or uh, the uh, depredations of invaders. And uh, we're seeing evidence of a new resurgence of China right now. Uh, they suffered horribly at the hands of the Mongols. Um, they, uh, they suffered... Unfortunately, they suffered rather badly at the hands of the Europeans and and uh, and uh, North Americans uh, during the 19th century. I, I don't think anyone wished China ill, but the, China was sort of taken to pieces and uh, and Chinese society kind of disintegrated. And you've got the warlord era and civil wars and uh, this ruthless dictator Mao Zedong eventually had to impose a new and durable regime on China. Um, so they don't have a history of conquest and huge wars the way that the West does. Um, so uh, one wonders uh, if there's maybe some throwback to the uh, to the Mongols or uh, or even farther back the Huns, where people believe that um, that people that look Oriental, I suppose one would ex one would uh, would uh, describe them as inherently nasty or uh, or savage, because well the Mongols uh, I think is kind of still in our collective imagination as Westerners as the epitome of senseless savagery. And as a history student, I think that there's at least some justice in seeing the Mongols as one of the most savage bunch in human history. Um, so that our, our view of the Chinese historically is kind of skewed. Um, but I, I still think that that kind of unease is still there. Uh, the Chinese are not a democracy. They're not a, a totalitarian communist dictatorship anymore. Um, I would say China is authoritarian. It's an authoritarian one-party state, uh, and uh, with the uh, the, um, the Communist Party t uh, taking over from where the Mandarins or Taipans used to uh, be the ruling group in China, um, and uh, with all the privileges and bureaucratic power that they used to have. So China is kind of getting back to its old way of doing things, in a manner of speaking. Uh, in a way, actually, uh, uh, Chiang Kai-shek, the uh, nationalist, uh, must be laughing from his grave, and Mao Zedong must be pretty angry, because the vision uh, that Chiang Kai-shek had of modern China is, uh, more, is closer to today's China than Mao Zedong's. So it's one of the ironies of history. Another thing is the Cultural Revolution of the 1960s, where China kind of went mad as a country, uh, turned in on itself, uh, just 
went crazy, more or less. And people, I think, haven't gotten over that yet. The, the whole prospect of this otherwise staid, um, obdurately conservative country becomes, for a while, uh, the cockpit of crazy revolutionary um, self-destruction for a very long period of time, for almost a decade. So um, I think that's still fresh in people's minds. But looking at China, China is subject to certain scrutinies and, and pressures and interference even, yes, interference in their internal affairs. They have to justify uh, even existing as, a, as an actual state. They have to justify their quote-unquote occupation of Tibet, which to the Chinese mind is just part of China. Uh, it's like the United States would have to justify the quote-unquote occupation of California and Texas, which were sort of taken from Mexico about 150 years ago. Um, that's kind of silly, because even the Mexicans don't believe that the, uh, that the Americans have to do that. They're pretty much cool with the idea that the United States uh, has a legitimate right to the American Southwest. Um, but the Chinese have to justify their their uh, possession of uh, Tibet, and they have to deal with a, at least a psychological uh, and uh, verbal uh, in interference in, in their what they see as their internal affairs. Um, Hong Kong and Macau, well, okay, they've recently, uh, in the last uh, 20 years, gotten those two colonies back from Portugal and uh, the United Kingdom, but they had to go through a lot of what one could even see as humiliating negotiations with people that really had no right in a certain uh, way of looking at it, uh, to be there in the first place. Um, why should China have had to have negotiated with the British or the Portuguese to get back pieces of their own territory? Uh, it, but again, I'm not saying that, 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 it, that it shouldn't have taken place like that, but that's, that's essentially what happened, at least from the Chinese perspective. That's, that's Chinese territory. Even today, if you've ever been to Hong Kong or Macau, they're not parts of China. There's, uh, when, you, when you take the, uh, the train to Lo Wu and cross the border into Shenzhen in, uh, in, uh, in Hong Kong, you practically have to cross the Berlin Wall uh, to, get, uh, to get from one to the other. Uh, so, uh, and, and not only that, uh, people in Hong Kong speak quite freely about what they think of the Chinese government, and usually it's not very, uh, not very flattering. Um, so the Chinese have had to have had to do these humiliating things, which you know no other country of China's stature would have tolerated. Uh, they have to uh, deal with the fact that they believe that uh, that Taiwan is an actual part of uh, of China, but uh, the rest of the world says, "Oh no, it isn't," and we'll back the Taiwanese if the Ch Taiwanese want to remain separate. Um, again, that's another uh, another uh, issue, but at least from the Chinese perspective, it's this, the, all these things are humiliating that they have to do this. Now, I don't think that the Chinese are as angry as we would be if we had to do this kind of thing. So, um, there is there are two sides to this story. Um, so, I wonder what it is that makes us so uneasy. Will the, will the world dominated by China, uh, which actually it won't be dominated by China, if you uh, to, the, to the extent that the, the modern world is not even really dominated by the United States. The United States has a hegemony, but I don't believe that the United States dominates the world in any way. Um, they might supplant the United States as the uh, most powerful superpower, uh, but Europe isn't going anywhere. India is rising. Uh, Japan is still there. And... North America is uh, still there. So what is it that makes us uneasy about, uh, about the rise of China? I would have thought that the, the increase in prosperity would be a cause for optimism in the world. Uh, you know, we're, we're uh, making sure that uh, uh, 1 billion, 300 million people uh, become educated, become uh, comfortably prosperous, so that they can start contributing to the better good of humanity. Why should, why should the Chinese not uh, have their place in the sun? Why should the Chinese not uh, get their crack at uh, seeing what they can do out of this, uh, this planet that we live on? Um, it's an interesting thing, and I think that it behooves us to look forward that way, because we may actually have to uh, one day deal with a world that's uh, dominated or at least um, hegemonized by China. And really, realistically speaking, looking at it dispassionately, is that really a bad thing? Um, I'm not saying it's going to be a good thing, but I, I, I don't think that it's as bad as we ought to make it out to be. Thank you.